appreciate that, Brother Dalton. Appreciate you helping us on staff. Brother Brady's come on staff this past week. He helped us with the music around here, and we sure are thankful for that. Good time to remind you that I'm happy that the altar is always open at First Baptist Church. And after we wait an invitation time, you can come forward during a song. And I imagine that some of you don't like people praying during songs. I imagine that. Sure, there's a little bit of ring tonight. Just remember the system's broken. We know that. New parts are coming. It's all back ordered. We're missing two, part, con two components. All right, so deal with the ring of the system tonight. We'll be just fine. Get back to the task at hand that uh, I imagine also that some of you felt impressed of the Holy Spirit to come and pray, and you didn't. And you didn't. We could do with a whole lot more praying and a whole lot less sitting at church. Sitting in church doesn't make you a good Christian any more than sitting in a fridge makes you a cucumber. <laughs> this morning, I preached on obeying God, following God. You're like, but I'm here, Lord. I'm 95% of the way there. Not good enough. All right, I'm not here uh, to, to get after you, but just to remind you that what I pray for, for every service, is, is that God would meet with us. That God would touch us. Now, that will look different with different people. Right? There's not just one look. We won't fall into the, the trap that some churches have where in order to have God meet with us, we have to have a certain thing happen, flopping around on the floor or every single person at the altar. We're not, we're not looking for, for mere metrics. We're asking God to meet with us, but a whole lot more movement should happen when God meet with us, meets with us than I think actually happens. Some of you would be helpful to sit a little closer in church. You can pretend your kids are singing and come right up front. All right? You can even pull out your phone and, and film me if it makes you feel better. You'll find when you're sitting up close that you can move pretty quickly to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's harder when you're, when you're way back in Never Never Land in the back. Now, I'm not fussing as you're sitting in the back. I'm just pointing out that I'm happy that people can be touched by the power of God. And at First Baptist Church, I'm, I'm pleased, I'm excited, and I'm happy with that response. If I'm preaching, you need to come do business, you come forward, all right? Well, people look, you better believe it. You better believe it. But they'll also look if you get up and go to the bathroom. I've been in church. I've done that before, haven't you? I mean, I mean it's like, it's, for whatever reason, it's not interesting until church time, then it's captivating. Look at them. <laughs> then they come back in. What happened? You don't know, but he's on the wow. Look at them walking. I've never seen someone walk before. Amazing things in church. Amazing things that the devil will use to distract you at church. I still remember being in a church one time, and it was a church that, that believed that women ought to wear hats in church. They took that from 1 Corinthians. We don't believe that way, but they did, and that's, that's fine. And um, this lady in a few rows in front of me had a hat that, for whatever reason, had these things coming off it that looked like a spider. And there I was in church, and I couldn't help but think this lady was getting her brain sucked out during the church service. <laughs> what the pastor preached on that night, I have no idea. I do remember the hat the lady wore that sucked her brains out. Amazing the things that will distract us. I'd like to come to church and be distracted by the Spirit of God. I'm okay with that. And for a moment at church, we put aside the other distractions in our life. We silence our cell phones. You can put them away. You can use them for your Bible. I don't mind that, but it may be helpful for some people to put them on airplane mode so those things don't just buzz and beep at you. You silence your cell phones and you silence those other things that can cause distractions. And for a few moments each week, we, we come together to worship God. I've been praying and, and, and I've been pleased with, with the folks involved with music. We've been trying to focus the attention in our services right toward where we're going, which is God himself. So that we can meet with God and we can worship God and Lord willing as we pray, Him with us. I pray every week that God would show up at church. Now think about that. That we could have church and God not show up at church. We could go, go through the motions and sing the songs and, and listen, I wonder what the services would look like if the physical presence of God actually showed up. He walked in that door. I wonder how you'd sing if Jesus Christ walked in and stood up here while we sang the old rugged cross. I wonder if you'd be looking around like that, so I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Two screens up there, really? Till my trophies at last. Pastor Ryan's tie, is it okay? 
I wonder what would happen if we realized that though we cannot see him, he is just as real and just as present. And as we sing, he's there joining us, worshiping with us as we worship him. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We come to church not to have a social gathering, not to just have a good time, though I hope we have a social gathering here at church. And I hope we have a good time. It's okay to laugh at church. But I pray and hope we come to church that Jesus Christ comes and we have a seriousness, a devotion that's worthy of a Savior. What we want to have at church is serious church. We know what play church looks like. This is serious stuff. This is life and death. If you have your Bibles, open to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians, the theme that I present in the book of Colossians, two words, Jesus Christ. Ephesians would submit it is the, the church, and Colossians, the head of the church, found in the person of Jesus Christ. Paul dealing with some issues as he comes to chapter 2, some false teaching, some false doctrine, needs some clarification. But Colossians, devoted, dedicated, written about the person, the work, the hope of Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, he introduces us to Jesus Christ. What a tremendous, what a fabulous, what an unbelievable introduction. I hope and pray that if you're here online, you've been introduced to Jesus Christ. If you never have, allow me, allow someone tonight to introduce you to Jesus Christ. He was not just a good teacher, though he was a good teacher. He was not just a good man, though he was a perfect man. He was not just a good son, though he was a perfect son. He is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, born of a virgin on this earth, lived a perfect, sinless, and holy life, died on the cross, rose again the third day, risen in heaven and reigns and rules and reigns on the right hand of God and intercedes for every single Christian. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. He is the most important person you will ever meet. And though I would imagine if you were to meet someone pretty famous, you'd tell everybody about it. I imagine if you got to meet a president, a senator, and took a picture, you'd show the picture. You ought to tell everybody you know about Jesus Christ. And tonight, in verses 3 through 8, I want to bring our attention as we look at the life of someone who has been introduced to Jesus Christ and who has met with Jesus Christ. This afternoon, we recorded the video for Easter. My family and I, I introduced my family in the video, supposed to be playing Easter morning. I encourage you to invite your friends and neighbors who aren't able to join us live Easter morning. We'll be here at 11 o'clock a.m. to join us on TV, Fox 66, NBC 25, and CW 46, 11 o'clock a.m. And we're praying that God will use that Easter broadcast to save lost sinners. I hope they enjoy the presentation, I hope the videos are moving, I hope the, the songs are captivating, I hope they listen when I preach, but if all that happens and they don't respond to the gospel, well then that's not what I'm praying for. Jesus said the fields are white unto harvest, and then he said, pray therefore, Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few, so you do your part. I introduced my family today. So Doreen, Johnny, James, and Danielle. If you were to meet my family and spend a couple minutes with us, you would know a couple of things. You'd learn a couple of things pretty quickly. You learn that we like to have a good time. Normally, we are laughing at the Howell House. Because of whom? It depends on the situation. Sometimes it's not something I said or something I've done. Sometimes it's something my wife has said or something she has done. Normally, it's not something the kids say, it's something they have done, and my wife and I shake our heads, and we say, how could two such intelligent people have three children? <laughs> Fill in the descriptive word there. We have a good time. If you spend a few more minutes, I hope you'd know that we love Jesus Christ. We're not perfect, and we don't claim to be perfect, 
But as Christians, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul introduces us to this church at Colossae, these Christians, those who have met with Jesus Christ, and they have demonstrated a reality of meeting Jesus Christ, of being introduced to Jesus Christ. You see, when someone meets Jesus Christ, when someone turns to Jesus Christ, their life ought to change. It ought not just to be a moment decision, though that's all it takes to turn to Jesus Christ. There ought to be some things that follow that decision. We call it discipleship. We call it growth. I wonder that if someone knows that you're a Christian, do they want to follow Jesus Christ? Because of your life, because of your testimony, because of the way you handle yourself and you navigate life, do they want to know the Jesus that you know? Do they want to know the God that you know because of how you live? You see, why would someone follow Jesus just based on some of the statements he made? Jesus said things like this, lose your life to find it. The Bible says to those that, that perish, these things are foolishness. Lose my life to find it? That doesn't make any sense. Give and you'll get. That doesn't make any sense. Seek my kingdom first, and these other things will be taken care of. If you really want to be successful in Jesus' economy, then deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. These statements stand as a stark contrast to the statements that worldly philosophy typically offers. You don't give to get, you take and hoard to have. You don't deny yourself, you pamper yourself. You don't seek someone else's good, you're supposed to seek your own good. And the statements of Jesus Christ, the call of Jesus Christ, stands in a stark contrast to what we normally, fleshly, humanly think, feel, and know. But in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, we have a description, a reality of some Christians of the church at Colossae. And it's what life with Jesus looks like. If you look, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says this, Paul says this, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love of which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and it bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Lord, I thank you for these moments that we have. Lord, I'd ask that tonight you would again meet with us. Lord, we have set aside just a few, well, just a few moments to meet with you as a congregation. But Lord, we dedicate this time to you, the service to you, Lord. I've prayed for it. Many of others have prayed for it. Lord, I'd ask that there would be no distractions that your truth would be clear, that it would be as powerful as you intended it to be. Lord, may our hearts be touched and changed so that we decide, Lord, to be like your son, Jesus Christ. But Lord, we need your grace tonight. We need your strength. Lord, help me as I speak, and would you use this time in Jesus' name I ask. Amen. I'd like to give us in the next few moments four characteristics that I see in these verses. Four characteristics of what life with Jesus looks like. Four easy characteristics, four quick characteristics. The first one I find in verse number three, we give thanks to God. The first characteristic of life with Jesus is life with Jesus is encouraging. 
Life with Jesus is encouraging. There is enough to be discouraged about in this world. There's enough to be discouraged just living the life that we live. There's enough to be discouraged just walking the walk we have to walk, going to work and coming home. There's enough discouragement. Life with Jesus is an encouragement. It is encouraging. And I see that right here. Paul says, we give thanks to God. You remember, Paul is sitting... He is sitting in jail. He is bound. He is not a free man at this point. And here he is, not whining, not complaining, not having a pity party for himself. Oh, it's so hard. Oh, it's so bad. But he instantly says, listen, I am thankful for you. And I'm thankful because of Christ Jesus and because of your walk with Jesus Christ. You see, we're often thankful for things that don't really matter. We have Thanksgiving time. We have Thanksgiving before we eat. And what do you thank the Lord for when you pray before we eat? Lord, thank you for this day. And I'm hopeful that you have a good day. I want you to have an amazing day at FBC. That's our tagline in those videos. Have an amazing day at FBC. First Baptist Church. I want you to have an amazing day. I hope you have a good day. I hope the sun shines and the birds chirp. All right? And your car drives well and your house heats up beautifully and your food doesn't burn. I'm glad for those things. But if that's all we're thankful for, then life will be pretty shallow. We ought to be thankful for the clothes that we have, and I'm thankful for that, and some new clothes for Easter most likely. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for lunch. I'm thankful that the bills are paid, and thankful that, that we have health. But if that's all we're thankful for, for the temporal, for the momentary things, then life will be shallow. But see, life with Jesus is encouraging because we can be thankful for eternal things for eternal change and he says I'm thankful for you and I give thanks to God for you because of what's happened in your life I was thinking about that this afternoon looking over the sermon and I was thinking about the the three shell haws kids who got baptized this morning and I'm thankful all right for was it Charlie Ronald and Lindsay who got baptized today I'm thankful that Karen got baptized today for decisions that it said, I want to follow Jesus Christ. I want to identify with Jesus Christ. I'm a whole lot more thankful for that than I am for lunch. Yet, if we're honest, if we're transparent, if we're genuine, we're actually more thankful for lunch. Jesus, after he fed the 5,000, Mentioned to the disciples how the crowd followed him after that. Not to hear the words of the kingdom, but for another free lunch. They wanted some more food. They wanted some more fish and bread. And I'm glad for those things. I'm glad that Jesus Christ brings those things and, and supplies our needs. I'm glad for clothes. I'm glad for vehicles. I'm glad for nice houses. I'm glad for health. I'm glad for beautiful weather. I'm glad for a beautiful building. But I'm thankful we ought to be thankful, we ought to be encouraged because life with Jesus brings eternal, eternal concepts into view. When someone gets saved, they once were bound for hell and a separation. Now they have a life promise with Jesus Christ forever and forever. You ought to come to church thankful that the gospel is preached and that lives are transformed and changed every single week here. Someone says, listen, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm thankful when the young people, when they say, listen, I choose to follow Jesus. I'm thankful when the old people say, I choose to follow Jesus Christ. I'm thankful when the rich say, I choose to follow Jesus Christ. I'm thankful when the poor say, I choose to follow Jesus Christ. I'm thankful, I'm encouraged, because Jesus Christ brings eternal change. We're not here. We're not here for the temporary. If that's all you're thankful for, if that's all you're guilty of being thankful for, then my friend, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. And Christian, those who have been saved a long time, let's get back to being thankful for what really matters. Let's get back to being thankful for what really is eternal. I read this little thing about whining. I'll read it for you now. Today, upon a bus... I saw a girl with golden hair. I envied her. She seemed so happy, and how I wished I were so. When suddenly she rose to leave, I saw her hobble down the aisle. She had but one foot and wore a crutch. But as she passed, a smile, Oh, Lord, forgive me when I whine. I have two feet. The world is mine. When I stopped to buy some sweets, the lad who served me had such charm. 
He seemed to radiate good cheer. His manner was so kind and warm. I said, it's nice to deal with you. Such courtesy I seldom find. He turned and said, oh, thank you, sir. And then I saw that he was blind. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two eyes. The world is mine. Walking down the street, I saw a child with eyes of blue. He stood and watched the others play. It seemed he knew not what to do. I stopped a moment. Then I said, why don't you join the others, dear? He looked ahead without a word, and then I knew he could not hear. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. I have two ears. The world is mine. With feet to take me where I'd go, with eyes to see the sunsets glow, with ears to hear when I, what I would know. I'm so blessed indeed. The world is mine. Oh, God, forgive me when I whine. That'd be a good lesson for all of us. But if that's where we stop, just for eyes, just for ears, and just for feet and hands, then we've missed what life with Jesus is all about. Because when you have life with Jesus, it doesn't matter how many ears you have, how well your eyes work, your ears or your feet. Listen, life with Jesus is encouraging because eternity is in view. Not only do I see an encouraging uh, characteristic, but I see an evidence, an evident characteristic. Look at verse number 4, where he says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. You see, when someone meets Jesus Christ, when someone is changed by Jesus Christ, there's going to be something evident. There ought to be something evident. There ought to be something that shows on the outside. And it's not just a nice suit and a nice tie and, and, a, and a dress. Those things are good and those things are fine. But there ought to be some tangible evidences of a transformation by Jesus Christ. What does it look like here? Two things. Faith and love. What am I saying? I'm saying this, that because of Jesus Christ, your faith ought to be on display. Or what has someone seen of your faith in your life? Could they point to something and say, listen, that person's a Christian because I see how they walk by faith. I observe how they walk by faith. Paul said of the church of Colossae, I heard, I heard about your faith. How did he hear about their faith? Was it just a profession of faith? Was it just some ramblings about faith? Or do you think it was something deeper than that? What do you think it was? I think it was something deeper than that. He heard of their faith, or he heard of the evidence of their faith. Or what has your faith produced? What has your faith produced? Well, pastor, of course it's produced something. I'm here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And you ought to be in church three times a week. You ought to be. You ought to be in church. Let me try that one more time. You ought to be in church. But evidence of faith is not just coming to church, my friend. If I can, that's the bare minimum if I can. That's like a no-brainer. That's like the game starts and you showed up for the game. Give me an award, I'm here. Give me an award, I'm on the team. No, you don't get a trophy just, just, for, just for showing up. What has your, what has my faith produced? And Paul says, listen, you've, you've met Jesus Christ and your faith has been evident because I've heard about your faith. We don't know all, the Bible doesn't tell us all of what that entails. I don't know if they suffered some persecution and endured persecution, though they very, they very, they very well could have during that time frame. I don't know if it was because of some phenomenal gifts right here that Paul's referring to, though that could have been it as well. I don't know if it was because of some far-reaching gospel effects, and maybe they sent people, missionaries around the globe. We don't know, but we know that Paul says, I heard about your faith, and I'm glad that he doesn't say exactly what he heard, because if he had, we'd be guilty of just doing those things. But he leaves it wide open. You have your faith in Jesus Christ, it did something, and we heard about it, and I'm sure thankful for it. Faith and love. Their love was evident. Jesus said that by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. This will be the marker. This will be the billboard. This will be the t-shirt. That ye have love one to another. That's right here. 
love inside the church. Three ways love is evident at the church. Three ways. Number one, forgiveness. Forgiveness. And be ye kind one to another. Right here in the church. Tender-hearted, forgiving. Say that word with me. Forgiving. Say it one more time. Forgiving. You know who's here? One another's here. Your wife's here, your husband's here, your mom's here, your dad's here. Your friends are here, maybe your co-worker's here. Grandma, grandpa, forgiving. If you're here at church longer than a couple weeks, someone's going to step on your toes. Maybe me, and maybe you on mine. Oh, you say, Pastor, you don't have any feelings. I do. I do. They're buried deep inside. You have to work hard to offend me, but you could offend me. You could say hurtful things to me. I could offend you. I can say hurtful things to you. Actions, all those can all happen. And one evidence of love in a church is forgiveness among the saints, among those who are saved. That means in the house at first, husband, wife, family, friends, but in the church. Boy, you know what? You really offended me, but I forgive you. I don't hold it against you. I don't treat you like I feel like you treated me. I forgive you. I have a spirit of forgiveness. Not only is there forgiveness, but there's prayer in church. There's evidence of love. James says that. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Evidence of love among Christians, two Christians, is prayer for each other. How are you doing so far on showing love? Forgiven. You have a grudge against somebody? You're not showing love. You're not praying for fellow Christians? You're not showing love? We have needs all the time here at First Baptist Church. You ought to pray for them. I use my phone for that. Someone will tell me, hey, I'm having a procedure done. I'll almost always stop real quick and put it in my phone when that happens. Because if not, I can forget about it. You can forget about it. Pray. Forgiveness. Prayer. Number three, compassion. That's what Colossians uh, 3 verse 12 says. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy and kindness. We should be an evidence, there should be an evidence of love in this church. Forgiveness, prayer, and compassion. Boy, how are you doing? What can I do? It's great to see you. It's easy to be compassionate and kind to those we get along with, but as you and I both well know, the gospel light attracts some strange bugs. Some of us are weird. Oh, and I'll get an amen there. I know you're all thinking of me, and that's okay. I'm not, that doesn't offend me. There's some strange people that are Christians, and they're not. Like, man, I, <laughs> Lord, are they really saved? Because they're weird. <laughs> Compassion says, I still love you. I'm still kind to you. Though your jokes may not be funny, and your jokes are like you smell. Compassion. I'm not saying anything you haven't thought at church before. Compassionate church. We get bent out of shape. Why are you sitting in my pew? Why did you ding my door in the parking lot at church? So your car gets dinged up. It happens. It happens. My car got smashed here once. That's fine. Compassion. Kindness. And Paul says, we heard about the evidence of you meeting Jesus Christ because it was evident. Because you showed some love. And I heard, Paul said, I heard, I heard about the love. There's two more, but I'm not going to finish them tonight. I think we've got to stop right there. How are we doing so far? How are we doing? Someone knows us. They say, boy, I want to meet Jesus. Or do they say, I would be a Christian if it weren't for Christians. We think we're doing good because we look nice and show the church. <laughs> we're not even in the game yet. There's a lost and dying world out there. 
needs Jesus Christ. And I want to introduce him to Jesus Christ. Not just with my speech. But we'll cross that. With the life. So this is what my faith has produced. This is what my love has produced. Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Lord, may we show with a life what you've done. Lord, may it not just be some words we say. May it not just be some platitudes. Lord, when you move in, you bring change. And Lord, I pray that our hearts, our life, will be evident of that change. Simple invitation, my friend. You show Jesus Christ or not? Maybe tonight God touched your heart. Maybe you say the right things and you sit in the right place. But your life doesn't match what the gospel brings. If you need to do business with God, I encourage you to come. Lord, bless this invitation. May we respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen.